Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. And so today's session is on adoption and engagement, the challenges of modern learning, which was the hottest topic in our last webinar when we asked you what you wanted to see uh, next. So diving straight in and introducing you to the team today, we're fortunate enough to be joined um, not only by our regulars, myself and Ben, to take you through today's session. We've also got from our US team, Tara Holter, who's our Director of Digital Learning Strategies and Solutions, who really um, understands modern learning methodologies and how to engage learners through a really wide range of different modalities. And we're also lucky enough to be joined today um, by Steve uh, Deneen. He's the CEO and founder of Fuse Universal. And I probably just butchered his um, surname, so I must apologize to Steve now. But Steve's going to be joining us um, so that he can explain what Fuse is doing to engage learners and some of the best practices and dive into some real data and real life examples a little bit later in today's session. So with that, we're going to jump right in. Some of you may have noticed from the invite, we mentioned an old line from an old movie, um, if you build it, they will come. And the honest truth is when it comes to a lot of learning interventions and especially technology platforms, this really is not the case. So um, you'll be hearing from us why and how to ensure that people will come when you do build out a new program or use a new modality or technology. So what are we going to be talking about today? Um, first of all, why is engagement so critical? I think we've all got a lot of opinions on this. But I think it's a great opportunity to, to really clarify that question. And then we're going to look at critical decisions before an intervention, during and after, as well as getting some examples of engagement in practice. And that's where Steve will be joining us um, to share there. And then we'll have a Q&A session. We're going to try and save some time there. But we've listened to your feedback. We're going to try and push through and get to the meat of the content as quickly as possible. Slides here. And I want to just first, before we go talk about learning engagement, as we normally do for these sessions, I want to get a common definition of what digital is. Right? We're not talking about e-learning, you know, a 45-minute compliance training you may have given to your staff. We're not just talking about you know, reading articles on your phone. When we talk about digital, and for the purpose of this conversation, and in general, what digital learning really means, what modern digital learning and what platforms such as Fuse and others enable is a create a backbone or a mechanism for you to bring all the modalities of learning, right, including traditional forms such as classroom training or coaching on the job, you know, even non-technically digital uh, modalities, to bring them all together into a coherent experience, an ecosystem that makes each of those modalities more effective and when done well, drives commitment to learning and, and, and ROI from those learning interventions and activities um, right through the roof. That's our, our mission here. So when we're talking about digital, we're talking about experiences that are micro experiences, experiences that are you know, self-led often, um, you know, because you want to hit large populations, you don't want to necessarily, you know, if you're going to invest in digital, you want to be able to hit a big population so they can really get the most out of it. We're talking about really relevant experiences, easy to access, might be social dimensions, continuous, pervasive experiences, experiences that are supported. You know, these are the types of words that we think about when we're talking about modern digital learning. And Really, this is the direction that, if you, that you're probably already moving in. And if you're not moving in that direction yet, it's maybe something that you're thinking about or maybe will, should be thinking about. Um, you know, th there's a lot of challenges to doing this really well. It can be done very, very well. And that's really what the purpose of this session is today, is to focusing on how to do engagement very, very well. Because if you do do it well, there's a lot of benefits. If you do bid digital right, you can increase the effectiveness of all of your learning interventions. You know, classroom is effective, but it has limits because it's like a fire hose. You know, you're just hitting learners with a cavalcade of information over a period of one or two or three days. They don't really have the capacity to retain it and then go and execute it on the job. 
so you can blend in learning more effectively. You can respect your learner's time and minimize disruptions. You know, we're working with all organizations around the world where they're working in plants and every time an engineer or a technician is off for the job, you know, that's an impact on that company's P&L. That's an impact for that individual. If a salesperson is off for the job, that's an impact. So how can we keep people on the job but also drive learning effectively? We can increase uh, long-term retention and change through effective use of digital uh, experience. Remember, digital, we're defining as blending together all the modalities of learning, leveraging technology to do so. You can be more agile and responsive to change. You can get data on the spot about how your learning is being received and what learners are doing and what they're not doing. And you can make quick changes to, to respond to that. Um, you can reach wider populations without diminishing the effectiveness of that. And you can access data analytics and ROI. So, um, so you know, this is really the benefits of it done right. But as I said, there's challenges. And those challenges are really driven by the difference between traditional learning and what we're talking about with modern digital learning. And some of those key differences, if we take classroom training, for example, you know, in classroom training or even, you know, e classical e-learning, you get an invite through your LMS, you're told to be somewhere at a certain date, you go into the room, of course, you only get out of it what you put in, but you have a facilitator leading you through it, right? But in modern digital learning, if you really want it to be scalable and effective, it needs to be some, to at least some degree self-led. It needs to be continuous. It needs to be micro because you've got to respect people's time. It needs to be pervasive, pervasive. So because of those facts, because you don't have a facilitator whipping them through it, you don't necessarily, you're not prescribing the learning to them, certain things become more relevant than they, they were in the past. You know, and what we want to avoid, we spoke about this in our last webinar, is you know, empty platforms when we invest in digital, but then no one turns up when we feel like we're wasting our time or our investment, and when the learning that we develop misses the mark. These are the three big challenges that people experience when they're exploring modern digital learning, digital ecosystems, and transformation. And I mentioned in our last webinar that you know, those challenges are either avoided or caused by the decisions we make around the technology and the platforms, around how we design the learning, and around learner engagement. And today, we're going to focus in on learner engagement as one of those critical elements that you've got to get right in order to drive good learning. And I want to point out here, learner engagement is critical for virtual instructor-led training. It is critical for classroom training. I'm not saying it's not critical in all cases, but it's even more critical when you're driving learning that is self-led, that is continuous, that is pervasive, that is something that learners need to drive um, on the job. So I want to start with a question. Let's talk about engaging your learners. Whether it's something that you're worried about happening, you maybe haven't deployed something yet, but you're paranoid or worried that we're going to have trouble in this area, or maybe it's something you're already doing where you're having trouble engaging your learners. In the chat, chatting to everyone, to all participants, to everyone, I would like you to tell me what would you say is a top challenges for engaging learners in the digital context, in the context in which I've described. So go ahead, let me have a look in the chat and I'll look to hear from you. It usually takes a second for people to type into the chat and I can see that we have over 100 people on the call today. So I can see some things are coming in. Keeping it interesting whilst covering topics of importance. Yeah, lack of interest, relevance is really difficult. I totally agree, thank you, Peggy making it interesting and relevant. We're seeing some things here, interesting and relevant, interesting and relevant. Um, when you don't have visual, it's challenging to see their reaction. Yeah, that's actually a worry. How do I know they're actually doing it, right? And so that's where data becomes relevant. Um, yeah, ben, we've got a couple messaging in the Q&A, so I'll just give you that one. Uh, learning is not their priority, perhaps. That was from um, Piada. Yeah, maybe their mindset around learning isn't quite there, and that connects into the learning culture element. Um, and also changing paradigms, we're all touch, tapping into this concept of culture. Where is our learning culture today? The number one uh, concern or fear that I hear in some of our clients who want to go down this path is they, you show them the pathway and then their react, immediate reaction is that's never going to work in our company. But it does, right? If you do it right, if you design right, you think about engagement right, you do the change management right. Um, leadership drive. So I think Harish has maybe mentioned the important role of leaders. Um, language and technical ability and capability of the learners, right? 
dealing with multiple languages, dealing with their tech savvy, right? That these are challenges that we've got to address. Participants not focusing. So that can both be an issue that you've got to address, but it might also be a premeditated fear that you have where you assume, like it's a trust issue. Our learners really going to focus, right? And engagement plays a big role in that. Uh, people not receptive to online learning. We work with a lot of banks, for example. And you know what banks say to us? They say, oh, the experience of digital today is of boring compliance training. You know, and so people have this, this when you say digital, they think, oh, that 45-minute mandatory training I had to do. So, so that, that's a mindset shift we have to make, discipline, distraction. Thank you, guys. You know, these are the challenges that, that we hear about from our clients, and it's the, it's the challenges that we try to address. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So mindset, culture, all of those things. So let's talk a little bit more about adoption engagement. The first thing we need to know about, you know, adoption of a new learning culture and then engagement in that learning culture. We're talking, talking to both of them because if you don't drive adoption, then that affects your ability to engage later. Is that it's not just one single thing. It's not just about putting a leaderboard and points in and saying, hey, there we go, right? Engagement and adoption is multi-layered. It's something that is embedded in your communications, your marketing, your all the different areas. We'll, we'll touch a lot of those in a moment, but it's multi-layered. It is. It develops over time. Um, you know, it's something that just it, you know. So to give you an example, you know, we work with a large bank in Singapore, and the very first digital experience they created, they wanted 300, but they only got 90. But because we have really interesting mechanisms, which I'll talk about in a moment. The next group, it filled over the top. And then now it's just the way they learn around, you know, after two years of that, it's now the way that people expect to learn in that business. So to start from zero exposure to getting a new learning culture, it happens over time. So we've got to remember that. That's, that's a realistic fact. And then also there's different approaches. So mainly I'm going to focus on the multi-layered and the developing over time today is for the tips and tools. But just quickly on the different approaches, they are... You know, the reason why there's different approaches is because your learning strategy needs to be aligned to your specific culture. Your culture might dictate a certain approach. The culture you're striving towards might dictate a certain approach. Um, the outcomes you're trying to achieve might dictate a certain approach. The types of learners you're trying to engage, right? There might be technicians and engineers in a plant, or there might be investment bankers out there uh, around the region, right? All of those things have to influence your decision around how you engage. And that's really what we're talking about, different approaches. But what we're going to do is we're going to zoom out a little bit and we're going to break down engagement tips and tools, which is what we're going to spend the next 15 minutes on, into a few different categories, right? Before an intervention or an experience launches, during, when it's actually running, and after. Now, I want to point out here that there are really, I guess, two different categories. There's concentric, single learning experiences that have a clear beginning and end that people might move through. But then there's also learning ecosystems. You know, Fuse creates both experiences, but also an ecosystem where learners are continuously engaging with each other and with material and content and consuming. But no matter whether we're talking about a broad ecosystem or if we're talking about an individual you know, learning experience with a clear middle and end, where these will apply to all scenarios. Um, so let's jump into before. And to be frank, this is the most important area. Before you actually launch, you know, there's some critical success criteria that we have to touch on. And I've touched on this on previous webinars, but I can't talk about engagement without talking about these because the reason why they're critical success criteria, because if you get them right, you will get an engaged group of learners, right? Um, and you'll notice that every other tool that I talk about from here in some way will relate back to these. So if we end the webinar right now, I want you to walk away with these five elements. Number one, ruthless relevance. Many of you have already highlighted that as being a number one challenge, right? How can I be relevant? And there's multiple layers to achieving relevance, whether it's relevance for multiple segments of a single learning population or company level relevance, cultural relevance, um, technical le relevance, vocabulary and, and jargon and language relevance. Learners have to see that something's relevant. If, if they watch something that's interesting but not relevant, they won't come back. So ruthless relevance is a critical factor that you need to be building into your design. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Creating connections. And I don't just mean connections to a facilitator or connections to a community manager. I also mean connections to each other and I mean connections to the content. 
right? So the content that they experience needs to be connected to them. And that kind of ties back to relevance. It needs to respect people's time. You know, if you run an experience that's a digital experience and you say, hey, go and watch this LinkedIn video series, and it's a three hour LinkedIn video series, and these people only need an awareness level of learning, not a detailed level of learning in this topic, then you're not respecting their time and you're also not being relevant. So we need to understand how much time do these learners have and how do we respect that? You gotta generate pull. Unlike a facilitator classroom training where I'm pushing people through the learning and hopefully pulling as well, but primarily they're pushed. When it's a self-led experience, micro learning, continuous learning, people need to feel like they want to come back. They're pulled back. The exact same motivation that has you guys when you're at home going onto YouTube when you want to figure something out or figure out how to cook something or change something. No one's pull, pushing you to do that. You're pulled to do it because you know that's a great source of information and you know you're going to find it easily. You've got to create that same feeling, that same sentiment in a corporate environment. And finally, collect data. Right, we've got to make sure that, the, that we're collecting data and using that data so we can be agile and responsive to what's going on so we can continuously engage our learners. If we stop the webinar right now, these are the central tenets of learner engagement. And there's very few things that you could tell me about your strategies for learner engagement that I couldn't connect back to these five elements. All right, so the reason why I bring this up is before, these need to be in your mind when you are designing digital experiences and thinking, how am I achieving these things? And if it's not working, go back and validate how well have I achieved those things. So let's jump into a couple of other tips um, you'll notice that each of my tips start off with follow the critical success criteria. That's always tip number one. You've got to answer the what's in it for me. Really quick snapshot of an example there is, you know, when we train leaders in the region, a manager of manager level people, right? So director level and above around leadership skills, how to be a talent producer, how to make sure you're collaborating with across functions and driving that culture in your team. We face leaders who don't care about that. Right? So I can't just give them content digitally and expect them to want to come in. So I need to create a what's in it for me. So I, what I might do is I might build a marketing plan around digital disruption in a bank or you know, the things that are meaning that we have to be agile as a business. I've got to pivot and reframe it. There's got to be a powerful what's in it for me. And that's got to feed into your marketing plan and your change plan right from the first communication and email all the way through to how you start the program, what videos you might capture from managers or leaders in the business what's in it for me is critical and that marketing and change plan is critical. It's got to be simple and it's got to be seamless, right? If you're going to deploy a, a digital experience, you're going to want to try to use single sign-on, right? You're going to want to try to make sure that the learners don't have to jump through hoops to get from content to content or experience to experience. For them, it's got to feel like a single ecosystem, right? And if you do that very, very well, that's a huge barrier removed for engagement. Um, and then you've got to build learner personas, so learner personas are something we do in the design process that helps us understand. It's not just a throwaway thing. We actually build learner personas to understand what's going on across this different population that we're targeting, right? The north, east, south, west of a learner population. Maybe we need to have eight learner personas, but we use those learner personas to validate how are we going to engage them? How, um, how much time do they have? What is relevant for those learners? All those pieces that I spoke about earlier, they uh, become relevant. But another thing that they do is they help us validate content. So we were given this list of content objectives by one of our clients, right? Module one, self-awareness, interpersonal effectiveness, getting future ready. And look at some of the examples here, work-life integration, task management, design thinking, right? So when we looked at this, right? Succeed for the future, influence skills, team contribution. When we looked at this, we knew that this population was actually for individual contributors. And when we went out, we did the learner personas and we interviewed um, different learners and we understood more about that business, it evolved into this, right? So this is about driving relevancy. We, we didn't put content in the center, we put learners in the center. And so all of a sudden we realized what they really need is a growth mindset. So we focus on that. What Instead of just self-awareness, self what they really want to do is grow their career. They want to succeed and thrive. So now it's going to be about that. It wasn't so much about design thinking, it was about future readiness, being resilient to change. You know, because what does design thinking mean to a 15-year frontline banking teller in a branch, right? Design thinking doesn't mean much to them. So we have to go through that process. So I've just grabbed a couple of little elements in the before phase that, um, that address uh, 
help you to build learner engagement from the start. Because honestly, if you're not doing it well in the design phase, in the pre-phase, then it's going to create challenges in the during and the post phase. So everything starts there. So quickly on during. Now this is where a lot of people spend their time. All right, a lot of people focus on how are we going to engage people during an actual experience or in the middle of being involved in our ecosystem. So I want to pause here and hear from you guys. What are some tools of the trade that you would be would deploy or are currently deploying to engage your learners today? Let me hear in the chat. So go ahead and before I share our tools. I can see you've got creating champions in the business. We're gonna we're gonna actually touch on that. Thank you, Harish. That's perfect. Yeah, online polls and quizzes are really, really valuable. If used intelligently, if you're respecting people's time with it and they feel relevant. Yeah, ad hoc assessments. Yeah, so we can use assessments to create personalized learning experiences as well, right? So little pulses of questions that then give them content that's relevant to their knowledge level. That's a powerful way to manage a continuous learning environment. Communication campaigns, ongoing. Yeah, using online tools. Rosalind, tell me some examples for some online tools, if you don't mind. Yeah, goal setting, celebrating successes, leaderboards and challenges. Yeah, breakout discussions. In a virtual environment, breakouts are a great way to engage people, for example. Online polls. Yeah, action learning is fantastic. Can be costly for clients too. Investing because you need action learning certified facilitators, but hugely valuable tool. Online quizzes, polls, gamification, puzzles. Yeah, I think you guys have got the gist. So what I want to talk about is again, follow the success criteria. Harness competition, right? Leverage not just individual leaderboards, but if you can, if you've got a cohort of 200 learners, create subsections where that 200 learners is broken into teams of six or eight or 10. And then there's a team leaderboard. And that has a powerful mechanism where because I'm in a team and maybe there's a team leaderboard that is an average of our team score, I know that if I haven't done anything that week or I haven't been engaged, that I'm bringing my team score down. And that creates a social pressure that pulls me back in, right? So I've got my team leaderboard, but I also have my team, sorry, my individual leaderboard and my team leaderboard. There's badging, there's all sorts of things you can do to harness competition. Leverage social and peer communities, like well, I kind of mentioned that, but include discussions. People are paranoid to include discussions, but if you use, pick the right platform, if you pick the right content, if you design it well, people will participate in discussions. They will respond to each other. Um, critical here, no one's really mentioned this in the chat, but deploy moderators and SMEs. Right, so moderators, you might call them a community engagement manager, right? So whenever we're rolling out a digital ecosystem or a digital experience, we put into that design process that there's gonna be a moderator. And the moderator's job is to do a whole range of different things, such as send out start strong and finish strong emails. Hey, start strong, here's something to know about that's going on this week, or finish strong. Right, here's some cool stuff. Hey, check out what Rosalind posted on Wednesday. Or check this video that Harish uploaded. You know, they then send that to all the other learners to then, first of all, recognize the ones who are contributing and be another pool. Oh, I want to check out Rosalind's video. I'm going to pull in and maybe I'm going to post something because now I'm inspired. So moderate is powerful because they also track the data around engagement. They get in touch with learners who've dropped off. You know, moderators are hugely important. They participate in discussions and so do SMEs. So in a leadership training context, context, a SMEs job is your leadership facilitator. So we've pivoted, GP Strategies across APAC has pivoted all of our leadership facilitators who are normally doing classroom and virtual sessions to also know how to operate on a platform where they're answering weekly questions and uploading videos and recording them and posting them on the fly where they are answering questions in chats and discussions, you know, and also running virtual instructor-led sessions along the way, right? It's a blend of modalities, but they're really, really critical. Some other tips is make it diverse, right? So you guys have already said that, right? So in one learning experience, right, here's a little screenshot from an experience we built for one of our clients in Singapore. Um, you know, it doesn't just include, um, it doesn't just include, you know, just read an article and watch a video. It should have polls, if you said. There should be missions, videos, interactions, discussions, games, on-the-job activities, peer reviews. You know, to use a blend of different micro actions so it's not always feeling like I'm getting the same thing. So diverse content is critical. Um, generate, uh, capture user-generated success stories. So I, this is really important. It's going to come into our after thing. But if you are designing, if you know that change management is a challenge, your business, right? You know that this is a culture change. 
I, what we do is we build into the design opportunities for learners to share videos that will inspire future learners. Hey, what's something that you learned? What's uh, a success that you had? What's a challenge that you had? What advice would you have for future learners? We build that into all of our learning experiences and ecosystems, especially not for all of them, but wherever learning culture and barriers exist. And then we use those videos with permission from the learners to make marketing videos to promote to the rest of the business who might be resistant, who might be reticent, right? Because a lot of times you're only starting with a small segment of a population. It's too too much risk. It's too big for it to go company wide. So we capture those stories and build them into videos because you know what's more powerful than hearing from HR or even hearing from leadership, hearing from other learners just like you. So we build that into the design up front. We it's a part of the experience, and then you'll see when I get to the post component that we capture those and might use those for marketing. Um, you know, be agile. Look at what's going on. Look at what's going on in the business. And uh, so, so Williams kind of said, you know, we've got to make sure that, that, uh, that, that, it's, that there's not too much of it, right? So this is all designed. If I go back to my design, we've built our learner personas. We know how much time they have. We know what's relevant to them. So if you've got that as your foundation, anything you're including, these micro learning activities aren't just engagement activities. They are learning delivery opportunities, right? Then there shouldn't just be something to just say, hey, that's exciting. It should also drive the learning forward. Yes, gamification might primarily be just for learning, but if you use your points allocation successfully, you can drive people towards critical learning by attracting them with greater level of points, you know, things like that. So it does all intersect. But you have to be agile. Look at the data. Look at what's going on on the experience. Look at what's going on in the platform and quickly react, right? Change it next week. If I see something's going on in week one and, and I don't like that, I'm going to change that. If I see that people are finding something not relevant or people are asking a lot of the same questions, I'm going to quickly curate something. I'm going to record a video from a subject matter expert. I'm going to bring in a manager to record something and I'm going to make it available to people ASAP, right? So you've got to be agile and you've got to communicate with your learners and let them know that even though they're by themselves on a train doing something on their phone, or maybe they're on a virtual training or whatever it might be that they are not actually alone. They're part of a community. They are connected. And really important, I put this at the end, but it's really, really critical is regular drumbeat, right? So especially important if it's an ecosystem, right? But that there's a regular drumbeat of content. It shouldn't drown them, but there's something that they can consume that's relevant, interesting. It respects their time on a regular basis. That's what creates that culture and also keeps them engaged. That's true for a single end-to-end -end experience, like the one that I meant that I've shown a little screenshot of here. There might just be one journey for 200 learners. Or it's also true for something like Fuse or, or some other learning platform that is more of a, an ecosystem that you're going to create. So that regular drumbeat. You know, and this is all work, right? It takes work. It's, it takes work from the learning team. It takes work from your learning partners. But you know, if done well and balanced correctly, this is a pivot in how we might have invested before. Instead of investing in training and booking venues and, and building new courses every three months, we're going to invest in the continuous experience where that same investment is being repositioned into create, curating content, creating community management and community engagement, you know, different things like that. So it's a pivot. So I'm almost done here. I'm about, I'm about to hand over to, um, to Steve, who's going to talk a little bit about Fuse. But you know, I just want to highlight just a few after practices. Um, Again, follow the success criteria about respecting people's time and making connections. Um, I've already mentioned about promoting those user-generated gener success stories that you've built into your design. Engage and deploy champions. I think somebody already said that earlier on. So thank you for bringing that up. We, again, you only do it if it's relevant for you guys, but we found it's very effective for change management to ask learners who have really excelled in the experience or are excelling in, in the ecosystem to become champions right? Because they can be very powerful tools in a new kickoff or in a marketing campaign or answering learner questions. And it's a great development opportunity for them in a world where perhaps maybe promotion isn't an option. So, so there are learners who love the opportunity to coach and support others. Um, and most importantly, be responsive to the data and the feedback you're receiving. And because most digital learning designs should be built in an agile way, you should be able to quickly take action without having to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, I've got a little example from one of our cases here where um, learners have, uh, we, we have at the end of the three month experience where it's one week launched every week, um, only one and a half hours of content per week with lots of micro learning assets. 
And at the end, we have a little mission where we ask them to go and record a video to tell us about their experience. And that, this is an example of one of those learners' videos. And we use those videos to then help market and pivot back to the rest of the population. And that's been super powerful in changing the learning culture, just that one activity. So marketing, it's multi-layered, right? Building and driving adoption and building engagement starts with knowing your culture, knowing where you are today, knowing who are your learners, knowing what is it you're trying to achieve from this learning experience, but also what are you trying to achieve from a learning culture standpoint? And then taking all that information, normally we do that in a design thinking process, and then formulating what is our engagement strategy? How are we going to drive adoption? And while I've broken into before, during, and after, to be frank, all of those tools that I've mentioned sit across the process. There's multiple layers. So, you know, let's wrap up there on this point. Remember, guys, really the center. If you're going to walk away with one thing, I've shown you lots of tools. You can watch it again on the recording. But driving ruthless relevance, creating connections, respecting time, generating pool, and collecting data are the essence of creating powerful experiences. So, um, so yeah, look, I'm going to pause there and I want to hand over to Steve. Steve, how are you, mate? Can you hear me okay? I'm doing good. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. And I just want to point out to everyone, it's about 4.34 a.m. <laughs> in London. Um, so Steve, as Oliver mentioned, is the CEO and founder of Fuse Universal. Some of you on the call would have come across Fuse before. Look, I'm going to let Fuse, uh, let Steve talk about Fuse and, and share some examples of engagement in practice in the context of a specific platform because the technology you choose impacts what tools you have available and how and the, the kind of experience you're going for and what decisions you'll make. The GP is technology agnostic. We partner with Fuse, we partner with a lot of different organizations. And what we try to do is we match companies like Fuse, organizations like Fuse, we partner with Fuse to help make sure you guys get the most from those platforms as you're developing, get the most from your ecosystem. So Fuse, Universal, Steve, over to you, mate. I'd like to say, if all those people were the only ones that turn up at 4.30 a.m. Absolutely. We, we, uh, <laughs> no one else I'm just kidding. Fuse is a great partner. Tell us about it, mate, and help us understand a little bit how what I've spoken about works in the context of Fuse. Perfect. And do I have um, a share screen right now? Yes. You, well, we'll give that to you right now. I'm just making you the presenter. And Thank you. You can go ahead and start sharing your screen as we speak. Excellent. Uh, so let me just share. Uh, Perfect. So you can see my screen, okay? You can see that screen and this screen. Is that all good? You can indeed. Thank um, you, Dave. Maybe. And you've got about um, 10. We could push to 15. 15 minutes, yeah. 10. Okay, so let me yeah. just get myself a, um, a stopwatch because I get excited. Um, so thank you so much um, for, I guess, the ability to talk to a couple of examples um, of what Fuse does in, in terms of, it's very much to your point, um, Engagement is something we really believe in, but we believe in it not just from an ideology side, but actually because the data tells us. Um, so what we now know with data is creating engagement and creating continuous learners is the most important asset uh, attribute to driving business value. Um, so much so, I think there's a, a really interesting case study which we've now got, which is a, a big global brand, uh, Avon, which has on our platform 130,000 active users a million content views, this is per month, uh, across 50 markets. And, and they, they looked at their data with all this amazing goldmine of rich learning activity, rich learning data globally, and they asked a the question to say, what's the difference in performance for those people that are trained users, as in they've gone through the digital courses, and actually business performance? And actually the answer came out pretty much the same as we see most researchers of most big companies doing that, and it was pretty much close to zero which you're probably thinking, well, why are you telling us that? That means that where digital learning doesn't work. Well, actually, when they did, when they looked at the, the other lens, which is the more popular lens that our clients look through, and say, what happens when we create and continuous learners? So what happens when we create engaged learners? So when they looked at engaged learners versus non-engaged learners, then it's a huge difference. In the Avon case study, uh, the two core business metrics are average order value and retaining of those beauty entrepreneurs across the world. So they saw a 6% increase in average order value and a 20% increase uh, in, in re retention of people. So a huge difference, and therefore focusing on the fact of how do, you, how do they create more continuous learners and more people um, that are learning in that way and not just they focus on a course, but they're going in and dipping in on a regular basis that it's done. So we, we talk to a concept where we, we look at our data and understand 
what's the things that drives continuous learning and drives continuous engagement. And we have a thing called the seven levers or seven practical tips to allow organizations to drive that. The first one I'm going to jump out to the platform and show is creating content in a way that allows you to use it in three ways automatically. So the move away from building big bulky courses into building bite-sized content that can be structured to create a formal experience, but can be searched to the point of need and discovery engines then use it to recommend here's a bite-sized piece of content. So if you've got five minutes spare, three minutes spare, here's the piece of content we most recommend you to watch. So if we take if we take that um, that idea, uh, and actually our idea actually initially came from um, our uh, our charity initially. Um, so we have a charity. If I just try and move, uh, try and actually move that so let's drop straight to the site. Um, so initially our, our ideas came from digitization of the secondary school system for our charity called Pew School, which we created 750 bite-sized videos between two and four minutes in length. Uh, which cover the educational system. It's that type of experience that we now took to our, our corporate clients. So here's the Avon experience that has 130,000 active users. Um, if we look at what, the, as an organization, they're trying to do, realistically, especially during lockdown, is really to move their people from selling just face-to-face, -face, which is obviously quite hard today, to being able to sell digitally. Um, so becoming, becoming social influencers um, and allow them to sell their wares and, and create their brand awareness um, through digital mechanisms. Um, so their core program um, is teaching people how to use Instagram and Facebook and Zoom and all these, these, these great tools. All the content they create is all created as bite-sized content. So although it sits in this formal learning plan, which has a structured list towards it, um, it means that uh, if I want to get back to a part and to this part that um, if I've forgotten something, it's unlikely people go back to a course to get it. So I want to refresh myself and say, actually, what's that? Um, how do I refresh myself on Instagram best practice that I can jump out and actually just type in and get to that bite sized piece of content uh, inside here to so get back to that basis of Instagram. So this one here, it's pop link to the top because it's got 20,000 views. Um, it's got you know, loads of likes, and that's why it's coming to the top in my, in my, in my search. Um, and that's a bite-sized piece of content that's two to three minutes in length and allows the, the learner to be able to go back to it, to refresh it, to watch it, and, and to get their way through it. So that's a, that's a critical way to think about the change, uh, the change learning. I just I showed a few seconds of that. Instagram has become one of the most popular social media platforms because it offers an easy tool for customization and self-expression. But what is it about? Once you've downloaded the app, you can stop. So let's go through the whole thing, but you can see here it's a few minutes of length. Uh, 566 likes, 8,000 views. This is the English version, and they have then they have different versions for each of their, their markets outside there. So the, the key thing I wanted to get through there is they're building all of their content in a way that allows their audience to consume it um, in one of those three ways, either through a structured learning plan, so getting through my business, first 90 days, a very much a structured approach. Um, but more, more importantly, most of the content views people coming back to because they can search and find that bit in a really quick, fast way. Um, and then also through recommendation feeds. So it's basically saying, because I know who you are and I know that you're English, uh, first speaking, I'm not going to give you the Brazilian content. I'm going to choose the right content for you at micro level. So on your mobile app or your desktop, I'm going to be able to be uh, just jump in with five minutes spare and, and watch the piece of content um, coming through here. You've still got, obviously, the formal events, so uh, there's still events happening on a regular basis. That still very much come, comes through there as well. So that's the, that's the, first, the first big, big tip, which is the, um, your content part. Building the content by its side uh, still allows you to actually create your formal structures, but it allows these two ways to happen, which is where a massive increase in engagement happens. And this is where the learning the flow of work is going to happen. This is not learning the flow of work. See, that's ruthless relevance and respecting time right there, right? But, absolutely, absolutely. And, and to the point that you know, you're learning the flow of work isn't running the formal course in the learning that in you know in your flow. That's not that's just interrupting your flow of work to do some formal learning. It's this bit that's allowing me to search and find the Instagram video when I, I'm just about to you know about to post my Instagram stuff. So it's it's designing your content backwards, knowing that actually that's what you want to try and do. The second point, and I think Ben talked to us already, is the use of community engagement. So you can see here in the recommendation feed, what's happening is people are creating content 
and they're creating and curating content relevant for each audience. So every, so the Avon team, the community managers for each country get together once a month and they share best practice for what community engagement is. So, you know, I was one, one of the calls, the lady in Romania saying, wow, I'm all new to this. What do I do? How do I get my market going? She listens into the community management experience of the other markets and says, great, let me just go and apply that, apply those techniques, and those tactics to her local market and had huge success in the same way that the other markets do. So that learning community management is a new skill, but learning it together is something that, that we really, really push forward to. The, the third big one here is leadership role modeling. So um, here's a good, another great example of one of our clients, Vodafone. Um, we use it in different parts around the world. Uh, John Shaw is the, the, the retail leader in the sales organization. So it has about 4,000 people reporting into him. But you can see here, it's his content being published. He has a partner, he doesn't do it all himself. So it's, he has a comms person and that comms person helps to make sure that content comes out regularly. But John is out there publishing both good news and bad news. You know, when there's a, a, a tough message to get out there, it's still John explaining that in a bite-sized piece of content. And you can see here, you know, um, 1,500 views, 200 likes. Um, but it, he's proactive, he's on the platform. It's not just been, been an advocate in concept, it's participating actually um, in the learning experience and being one with the learners. So that's, that's another big one for us. The other thing that we, we've, we do with our clients, and GP obviously does as well, is recognize you need new skill sets inside L&D. So uh, these are some of the new skill sets that, that uh, our clients learn on the journey, that GP teach, that we teach, from your learning business partner, which is the stuff that GP is talking to, Ben is talking about. So how do we help and advise and guide you? Community engagement. Uh, the digital social trainer is really interesting. So how do your trainer go from, you know, my, I, I teach in the classroom to actually the internet in my classroom? So, you know, very much like a YouTube channel uh, person, you know, we, we, are, we have an uh, educational charity YouTube channel that has um, about 2 million views a month. And the, the job of our curator is to make sure they answer the questions of all those audiences coming through. Obviously, the people that help Steve, people. If I could just sure. say that a lot of companies, you know, a lot of our clients in, in Asia run fairly lean learning teams. Um, and so it's just not possible to have these roles, at least at the beginning, to make that investment. So, so that's kind of, I think, where GP and Fuse partner is that sure. we actually provide these roles to, you know, because I saw that uh, William had mentioned that, yeah, being a learning moderator is a full-time job. Yeah, it's time-consuming. Um, and that we try to maintain a, a team of people who can do this type of stuff where organizations don't have the capacity or the desire to kind of fill those roles themselves. So it shouldn't feel like a barrier. And, but I think also to the point, and I think also if you can prove the value of that, then resource becomes easier. So if you're able to, in the case of Avon, they've got the learning data and the business data. So the whole time they're making correlation between the two. So if they're proving that when, and what they do know is when they have someone that is either part-time, I mean, they don't really have full-time communicating managers, but it's a part-time role of someone else's job. But what they do see is the community engagement management has a big impact in terms of um, learning engagement. And learning engagement has a big impact in terms of business value. So if, if we're driving it back from business value, it becomes easier to articulate. If we're just trying to explain it on hope, it's a harder argument to make, which therefore the next tip is, is data, right? So data becomes the, the absolute, our, our methodology, if we like, to explain, explain value. So if I looked at, um, you know, the Able Month, for example, we can see here that last month, 131,000 active users, up 25%. Well, what content are they, are they coming through? Well, actually, so video is number one for them. So 46% of what they're watching is bite-sized small videos, 30% is uploading files, and about 17% score courses. I can then go through and I can dive in and I can ask questions of that data. I can jump out to analytics tools. And I can go much, much deeper in, in terms of that. So the, the data piece, if you like, we think is absolutely critical um, as a skill set to learn, a skill set to leverage from GP and the like in, in order to understand um, how do we prove, once we prove that learning engagement is critical, then what's the things that are driving it? Is it, is it the leadership team? Is it, in the case of Avon's case, the biggest impact is um, the sales leaders within the organization. That's the number one thing. But for other organizations, it's going to be different things. You get to the secret source, you can tweak that lever and increase the value. Um, so the point we talked about here in terms of designing, uh, designing for learning to drive work, so this is um, making sure you're not building just this big bulky content that people will never go back to. You know, it's about when you think about the program, some of our clients 
actually designed between 60 to 90% of the content not to be taught formally. They're designing it only for learning the flow of work. And only 10 to 30% is taught in a formal type fashion, in an onboarding fashion, or what we you know, traditionally would call a course. So these three examples, if you look at Rentical, one of our clients, they use the deep linking components of the app uh, and bite-sized content. So a QR, there's QR codes on every Rentical pest device control. So on the learning app, they QR code it or they QR code with a camera and it pops out deep linked straight into the relevant geotag bite-sized piece of content that says on this rat trap, in this country, in this location, here's what you do. Uh, another one of our clients, Demont, integrates performance support tools into Fuse. So if you're inside a field in Salesforce, you click on the field and it says, I recognize you're at stage three in your sales process. Here's the bite-sized piece of content from the best expert, the best authentic person in the company that's going to tell you how to get, the, how to get your sale from this stage to this stage. Uh, and if you go to a Vodafone store in the UK and, and one, of the, one of our partners, Charles Jennings, went into a store a few weeks ago, asked the person at Vodafone and says, oh, do you use Fuse? The answer was, I've used it three times already this morning. Because of the, the use the most, because the central team is creating and has done for five years now. The central team is creating all the content in, as either PDFs, videos, um, one page for graphics, but everything by the central team, the communications team, and the learning team is created and consumed in that moment. So it's their it's their knowledge tool as well as their learning tool, and it's when those two worlds combine that it becomes that learning becomes truly truly exciting. And then the last one, I think, this is again where GP absolutely are, are world class is the um, accepting the fact to move to this new world. It's not just a case of turning on the platform. We recognize that. Obviously, in our opinion, and hopefully GPs, we might have the best uh, learning technology in the world. We think we do. I think uh, Ben agrees with that. Uh, but even if he didn't, he, even if he didn't, right, he would recognize it's not just about the technology, right? That um, we well, can- Well, I know that clients have different use cases and different levels of readiness, right? And so some clients, they see Fuse and they go, ah, oh, I want to do it, but we want to start with something, a smaller population or a small segment. And so there's always a conversation like that. But you're right. The process of onboarding into the world of digital learning is something that has to be discussed before kind of jumping in first, you know, jumping into the platform. So it's a good point. And I think, and I think to, to that, to the last point, really, it, I, I think um, if I summarize what we're seeing here, guys, what's really exciting is, well, the first thing, let me caveat that with what, what a lot of us know is actually when you look at traditional L&D training, classroom-based or e-learning-based, and, and we try to attribute value to it, the answer comes out most of the time is there's not much value. This, this new concept, which is creating continuous learners by creating the environment with the things we talked about today that allows individuals to become pulling the learning down, searching the point of need, wanting to drop in at, at the you know, one. We spend 220 minutes a day on a mobile phones. Um, to get to some of those three-minute chunks where they're inspired to go and look at the platform in the same way they look at Facebook and YouTube and so forth, as well as it has my formal path towards it, to create that type of stuff. We know by creating that type of culture, that type of learner, we can absolutely use data to prove the business value of that pretty much across any role. Uh, but to the point, and the last point is, it's not a case of just putting some technology there, buying a, a library of content and saying I've sorted it. You know, it, it does need thinking and it does need change to come to that world. And again, that's right. what- There's a before, the during, and an after kind of thing in, in every strategy for this, right? So, so, um, so guys, we're gonna, we're gonna move into Q and A, Steve. So, so yeah. thank you so much um, for getting up so early and, and showing <laughs> it learning engagement in the context of a, of a real environment, a real platform. You know, um, so and, and sharing the Avon story as well, which is pretty amazing. So thank you so much for your time, mate. Um, Oliver, let's run a bit of a QA. and a I'm already seeing some questions crop up. And if I could have presenter rights, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So time to dive into the Q&A. And just one thing that really jumped out at me is, you know, for a lot of the, the folks that we speak to, the big question is, you know, yes, we know there's a change in learning happening. And we know that there are these new roles in learning that we need to think about. But you know, we only have so much budget and we've got so many priorities. And I just love that about the data. When you can tie, you know, that, that last one of the uh, critical success criteria that, that Steve also focused on, tying that data in just makes such a, a huge difference. So we'll open it now um, up to questions. And so do drop your questions in the, the chat box. Steve is on. We haven't heard from Kara yet, but she's here for this um, Q&A opportunity. Um, so. You know, we're not focused on one platform here. We can go well beyond. 
but just drop those questions in the chat and um, and we will do our best to, to look at answering them. Multiply effect, make it business. This is from Harish. So L and B, and Lee should enable what business wants and be agile and evolving. I mean, it depends on what company you're in, right? There are some companies that have incredibly decentralized learning and development strategies and teams, other companies that have a stronger centralized model. Um, but one of the best approaches that we found um, in, in driving adoption and engagement, you know, in a perfect world, you go in and you're speaking to the CEO of a business and everyone across the different functional lines of a 50,000 person company or a 10,000 person company, they're all on board and they're ready to kind of have that strategic conversation. More often than not, what happens, however, is that there's a lot of stakeholders who don't really get it, who aren't really that invested. The business as a whole isn't prepared to, to go enterprise-wide or company-wide yet. So what we do is we do it from a bottom-up effect where you partner with L&D to maybe pick a population on some, an experience or something that's going to be influential and then use that data, use those results to then say, hey, guys, this is impactful. This is better than what you're currently doing. And you watch the dominoes fall, right? All those resistant stakeholders start to come across. So there's a few different ap approaches. L&D can drive it, but it's not always L&D driving it. Sometimes it's sales and marketing. Sometimes it's the compliance and risk team that drives the first kind of steps into this space. But uh, it's a good point, Harish. Thank you. And so, Danny, I think it's, it's fair, fair to say as well that, um, you know, when we dive in, and I'll talk about the next session um, a little bit later just before we close off and share a link with everybody for uh, our beginning of September session. But when we look at design, you'll see this, um, you know, engaging stakeholders in the design process, getting their buy-in there is also really key. So, yeah. Well, Peggy's, um, so we, Peggy's made yes. not a question but a statement. It's always a challenge to sustain the interest after the initial excitement. So, you know, this is where you start to talk about an event versus a culture, right? And, and I'm going to actually call Steve in to talk about his experience of Fuse. But for us, you know, when we're working with different approaches and platforms, yes, that is one of the challenges. But if, again, if you're being learner centric, if you're designing right, if you're respecting people's time, if you've got the right amount of push and pull, you've got the right drumbeat, if you've got the right level of relevancy, it's less difficult to make people come back. It's the sustainment is difficult. Like for example, you know, I know organizations and I'm a, I'm a fan of LinkedIn learning, but they've deployed LinkedIn learning and there was a big hurrah about it. But then engagement levels dropped to sub 10%, sub 15%. And the reason for that is because LinkedIn learning by itself has interesting content, but where is the layer of relevance that says this is Avon, um, the Avon story of working on Instagram, or this is the, Bank of China story of, you know, risk and compliance in this context, you know, so, so LinkedIn learning can work by itself as an example, but you do see that drop off. And so what's missing there, if you look at my critical success criteria, some of these elements aren't met. And for LinkedIn learning, it's ruthless relevance. It might be respecting time and a few others. What's your experience with that, Steve? Yeah, I think it's a great point, right? So again, we looked at, we had the benefit of looking at our data across all our global clients across the world. And what the data says is only 10% of the views of content are outside of the organizational knowledge. So in other words, 90% of what people want to get to is the expertise within the company. So the, the, your, your third party generic content has a value, but it's not the high value stuff, right? It's the, it's the I, if I want to change my job from job Y to job X, those generic libraries are a good place to do some one-on-one -on -one basic starting. But if you want to drive performance and you want to get people close to the best salesperson, the best customer services person, then the, the thing is, how do you digitize that knowledge organization mm. and how do you make it frictionless to get towards it? That's a technology thing it, and it's a content thing too. And maybe in answer to that, that question that was coming through, the, what we see is a regular drumbeat of that style of content and some clients are literally religious to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. There's a publication of that part in exactly the same way as social media in using your kind of marketing techniques for social media. They use exactly the same techniques as social media and marketing uh, inside L&D to, to have that impact. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Steve. Lawrence mentioned that, that a good point into about the next question from from Yogesh quite well. Is um, you know which tools make the transformation of, um, of learner to modern learner effective? Um, one of the things that Ben, before I pass over to you for this question, that I'll sort of highlight is something we mentioned on on one of our our more recent sessions. 
which is that when we talk about this transformation to these modern learning techniques, and we talk about how new they may be within the corporate setting, these aren't new to your learners. You know, if you think about how you go and learn and um, you know experience the world outside of work, these these are, are normal. You know, the way social media works, the way you search for things. This is not uh, something that is new to your learner. It's just new to your organization. So, sorry, Ben, I, I um, spoke over you. No, I think it's a great point that the behaviors and the mindset's already there, right? And it's not just from an 18-year-old or a 25-year-old. You know, my mom is 69, and she is as agile on YouTube and social media and finding things on Google. In fact, I can't say something to her that she won't challenge and see if it's right on Google over dinner, you know. So, so it's an embedded behavior that we've got. All we're trying to do is tap into that innate mindset, and the way you do it is by replicating those behaviors. I know that when I go to YouTube, there is valuable, relevant information, and I can search for it, and I'm easy. The same thing for Fuse. I know because of the way it's designed, because the content is relevant, that I've had some success the first couple of times, and then that promotes me to want to come back the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time. But if you're not doing it right, if you're not providing relevant content, if you're not looking at the whole picture here, then yes, maybe any, any platform can be unsuccessful if you're not using it right. The, you know, the tool by itself is not the answer. The tool plus the user becomes the answer. So, um, so I think that's a good point. There's a few really interesting comments here. Um, Laurie's spoken about um, in the automotive space, and he's kind of highlighted one of my points about the ramp up, right? That things develop over time, right? Initially, it seems like Laurie saw that, you know, there was a bit of a slow uptake, but because they were getting data on the fly, they were able to tweak the experience on the fly to better adjust to that audience and resolve that issue. So I think that's another story, a testament to the power of data and agility in this type of environment. And if you look at a classroom training or, or an e-learning, you know, a 40 minute or a 60 minute or a two day training, it's very hard to be agile in that context because it's in a box. It's, off, it's not off the shelf necessarily, but once it's delivered to the learner, it's boxed up, it's ready to go. And the onus is on the facilitator to be able to be agile. And a lot of companies say deliver it like this. You know, so look, I know we're at the top of the hour. We're going to stick around and answer more questions. So please feel free to do so. Well, ben, I'm Oscar. just going to just just before we continue with the question. So, oh so, yeah, I'll uh, jump down there. To let everybody know that, um, yeah, Ben um, and I for for certain will be will be hanging around to answer any questions. So we will let the session continue. Um, but for those of you, I can see in the um, in the chat that need to drop off right now as we come to the top of the hour. Um, just to let you know that coming up next in our thriving, not just surviving series, we're going to be um, speaking on the 2nd of September. We're going to talk about modern digital learning design. So, you know, how can you get yourself started, um, you know, before you even look at platforms or tools, or maybe you already have them in place, but you want to look at how are we going to design an experience? How are we going to design a community? How are we going to design our next intervention? Mm. And how can what does relevance look stuff? like? Exactly. What does relevance look like, for example? What does generating pull look like in the design process? How do we get to what good looks like? And that's going to happen on the 2nd of September. And I'm going to drop a link right now um, to that one um, for the digital design webinar um, into the chat box. And you will be getting this um, through our email communication as well. It'll be on our website. Most of us have a, uh, a banner at the bottom of our um, signatures, so you can click on that as well. And then on the 30th of September, something a bit different, but um, maybe a little bit the same as well, we're going to have another webinar on the 30th. And that's going to be looking at the um, APAC specific insight from our global survey, where we spoke to leaders around the world on and individual contributors and individual contributors about leadership on business uh, as unusual. So looking at, at what business is now looking like in the age post-COVID. So we'll be sharing that um, information. And we should say post-COVID. Yes. Because it's not quite post yet, is it? Indeed. Um, indeed. I'm, it's wishful thinking, I, uh, I will admit. So I'll drop that link as well into the chat box. And Oliver, I do want to address George's question. George, I hope you're still on, and I apologize we didn't get to it straight away. But please, you know, click on those links, sign up for our next webinar so we can, you know, have more of the continue our discussion. But George has uh, specifically said, having difficulty working with a client that won't invest in the right platform to facilitate, um, you know, the before, during, and after. And I'll say a few things to that. Number one, 
you know, the platform does kind of dictate your toolbox to an extent, right? So, so making sure you've got the right platforms that's the right fit for that business at that time is critical. But I will say the point about not, commit, not committing, we're constantly faced with that challenge. And for us, we put it down to, um, you know, risk, right? Fear and risk, right? About, you know, going whole hog and jumping into it, but then also lack of education. So, I mean, part of these webinar series and in general, we sp I spend a lot of time with our existing customers, future customers, with our partners, trying to just speak about digital, what we're talking about today. Like, what does it really take to do this well? What happens? What are the possible outcomes? What are the challenges you might face? You know, what happens if you don't make certain decisions or if you make the wrong decisions at the wrong time or whatever it might be? And we try to spend a lot of time educa in education phase. Um, and that's so far the, the best way we've found to kind of overcome that. Because if, if someone isn't investing, people only don't invest and put time into things when they don't see the value. Or the risk of doing something outweighs what they perceive as the reward, psychologically speaking. So a lot of time needs to be spent in that area. And, and I just want to echo that I do experience that with clients say, we need to go in this direction. But then when you show them what that direction looks like, and I'm sure Steve experiences this too, they're, they're like, oh gosh, that feels scary. You know, it feels... You know, and that's because maybe they're not quite there yet. So that's my only comment I could give to that, George. I hope that was helpful. Invest more time in education and touching on what does it take to design? What does it take to engage? You know, all of those pain points they may be worried about. Steve, any comments yeah, on that for then, you? Oh, Cara, I'll yeah. jump in here. I've been very quiet, but every time I'm about ready to say something, you guys say what I was going to say anyway. So it's been great. <laughs> um, but no, actually, I think along those lines, one of the things that, that um, I've had uh, similar conversations with many of our clients, um, and I think one of the ways that we've started to tackle that too is, well, you don't necessarily need to dive head first into a full, you know, brand new application. And and what I mean by there's just a couple different paths you could take. One of which is use what you have, um, get creative and think about the tools that you do have at your disposal already. Um, you know, it, Teams, for example, Microsoft Teams is pushing out new things, new features almost daily. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things you can start to do to get creative with using that. Um, and many of the other Microsoft products as well. You know, what does your current LMS have? They may have some feature sets in there that maybe you haven't tapped into yet. Um, what other tools are, are you know, to, to some of the points that I think Steve especially made, when you start trying to get closer to the flow of work, what tools are they using in the flow of work? You know, um, if you look at Salesforce, for example, you know, what, what tools do they have available within a tool like that that you can tap into? Um, so I think if you can tap into some existing tools and maybe use them in some different and creative ways, it's a it's an interesting way to at least get buy-in that those types of strategies work, and then you can convince them to say, and if we really want to do it, you know, here's how we can do it even better. Um, the other side of that is start small um, and go for a pilot approach and try to do you know a small investment with a, a small group before you try to you know go enterprise wide. Um, and I think Ben, you had kind of mentioned a few things along those lines too. But yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you've just said, Cara. Yeah. All right now, I can see that um, a lot of attendees um, have have dropped off, but we still got 65 who are on and uh, listening to our answers to questions. I see one other question that we've not answered, and um, the the question asker has actually dropped off, but it might be worth covering because it's such an important topic the uh, raised. So um, this is from um, Piada. I hope I'm not uh, getting her name wrong or his name wrong. Um, any, uh, any suggestion on the dimension we should track um, for learning data in order to pivot? So uh, what, are the, what are the metrics? I've, I've learned, he might have yeah, I'd love, love to shout about it, right? Because I think it's, it's, I think we're in a, in a really truly exciting moment and I think the data is coming out. And I think that first piece of that first piece of research that we did, it really points to now um, the tracking of, of active usage as the, as the core metric rather than course completion. Because, you know, go back to that core, that core uh, case study. I've heard it so many times that L&D department says, well, you can't manage, you can't measure training because you've measured it. We've taken the thousands of courses, we've measured it against business performance and the answer comes out as nothing. Whereas now what we're seeing, and we've got 10 different case studies where, where organizations have created continuous engagement. What they're doing, so Vodafone, for example, years ago, they, they put their learners into four quadrants on a program from highest engaged to lowest engaged, um, and then saw directly actually the people that were low engaged 
are performing 14% worse than the people in the middle level. But actually, there was an optimum level of engagement that when people went too much and were just literally using our platform like Facebook, then actually it wasn't as good as, as, the, as the optimum level. So I think uh, absolutely that um, active usage is a far more useful measurement. But obviously, once you prove there's a connection between engagement, continuous learning, and, and the key KPIs of the organization of that role. Well, one of the other interesting things that I'd add is the power of anecdotal performance feedback, right? So when, when we capture videos, some of the best feedback we capture for the experiences we deploy with our clients are videos of learners telling a story that you would never have captured, right? As something they went out and tried and did that really maybe was indirectly related to something they were learning, but inspired by the learning, you know, because those stories are real performance, you know, so don't um, ignore anecdotal feedback and find and create opportunities to do that. But the other thing that's interesting is a lot of time we spend, as Steve said, recording completion, right? I know a lot of uh, learning partners of ours whose target KPI is number of trainings ran and number of attendees, right? Um, not nothing about learning efficacy. And and what's interesting is learning effectiveness, right? There's a whole conversation we could have about measurements, but I would just add one other piece here is when you're rolling out these experiences, you might have targets that are not related to learning effectiveness, but culture change, right? So for example, there's an organization we work with that wants to promote more social discussion. So one of the things they wanted to measure was how many discussions are going on how, how many, what percentage of users are participating in discussions and what percentage of users are responding to other users' discussions, right? Because that was a culture they wanted to create. So you can actually build in metrics and measurements that enable you to measure things beyond just learning effectiveness. That is critical, but also measure, you know, knowing what you want to drive in your culture can help you build in and make decisions around what is the technology or what is the approach that's going to get us to that culture. And I don't want to measure that happening. So yeah, there's a lot more you can measure now. I, I love that. Just to come in on the, onto that just really quickly, because I think that's what everyone wants to create, right? Everyone talks to how do we create a learning culture? Well, the question, therefore, is how do we measure it's happening and how do we measure the value of that? So I think if we wrap together two of those three things, saying it's a learning culture we want to create, engagement is probably the core metric, and then attributing that to business value or designing backwards and business value, knowing that engagement is going to be a core thing. So I think there's, yeah, there's a great catalyst of a few things there together. Okay. okay, well, look, it's 10 minutes past the hour. It doesn't look like any more questions are coming. We're just getting a lot of thank yous. So I just return the thanks to everyone on this call. Oliver, what, oh, wait, didn't you tell me? Yeah, Grace has just messaged just saying it, it tells her that they're at the, the nascent stage of digital learning. And um, I think that uh, that's fair to say, even with the organizations mm -hmm. that are maybe on the, the real forefront of it, there, there is so much potential and so much more that can be done and, and will be done. And I mean, we don't even need to sort of imagine into the future. We just need to look at how people live their lives, make their decisions, and, and do their own learning out in the wild. Um, and, and if we just caught up there, we would already be, um, you know, that's already light years ahead of where most organizations are today. And so the future is, is, is really, really exciting. So well, once for again, Grace, we, I just want to say that, you know, perfect. when we first started working with a large Singaporean bank, they had never done, the, all of their learning, first of all, their, their organizational culture was very hierarchical, very kind of Singaporean culture, um, very traditional, very risk averse. Um, the learning culture itself was mandatory e-learnings, classroom training for top talents only, you know, maybe some product training and systems training, compliance training, you know, that was their whole culture. And any learning that did happen was prescribed, it was top down, it was, you know, they didn't even have an LMS when we first started working with them. The LMS actually came later. And during the design process, there was a lot of fear, right? We were saying, oh, in week one, we want to put some discussions in there in, the, in week one of the experience. And they were like, oh, no, 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 no one will participate. It'll be tumbleweed. No one will actually be in there. And, 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 we'll, and we also wanted to put in an upload of a video. We'll get them to upload a video. And they were kind of very resistant to that. And in the end, it was a bit of push and pull. We were like, trust, trust the process, the design process. Trust that your learners, if we do this right, will participate, even if they've never done it before. And, and but then also okay fine let's move the video sharing to month two or week four but let's keep that discussion in there and challenge it right because we can get data and we can be agile and change and lo and behold when people jumped in that very first population going from zero digital culture did modern digital learning zero of this happening 
they went from zero to 100 in terms of this team. That everyone was in the discussions, people were uploading videos, people were participating. It was it was just you know so so don't don't underestimate the quality and capability of your learners' ability to jump in. But admittedly, for, for that bank, it was starting with an individual contributor population. We used the outcomes of that to market to the rest of the business, so the rest of the business jumped on board, and it was a process, right? But now three years in, they've got you know multiple different programs using this technology. So um, yeah, they didn't have an LMS to start, um, and so now they do have an LMS, and so now LMS is their gateway, right, into then accessing these other experiences and platforms that we've built with them, right? So, and maybe one day they'll look at Fuse and they'll realize, hey, you know what, traditional LMS isn't giving us what they need because I'm telling you they are facing frustrations with their, their LMS and it's, it's actual limited capability. So, so yeah, that's kind of, that's the story. And it's not, there's a bank in China, one of the biggest banks on the planet we're doing and having a similar conversation with. To be honest, it's almost every customer in Asia, especially we're having that conversation starting from zero. So don't be afraid with it, but yes, you've got to do it right. You've got to do the right pr process of design to do it correctly. And, and I think that's what we're really good at. So, so well, thanks for that I, comment, I, I Grace. Think, I think that that also raises one of the points of how to kind of get started with this. Um, the, the Singaporean bank example is one of those situations where they had an intractable problem, something that they couldn't solve with their existing tool. And it was the scalability. You know, how right. do you train 18,000 people? Learners. Yeah. How do you train 18,000 people when all you've got is uh, compliance, e-learning and classroom? And, and so it really was that kind of push. And, and I think that a lot of people are finding, a lot of organizations are finding the remote working realities of, of today, um, another push towards, right, well, we've got to do something. And it, it's that opportunity. And, and the danger is that you try and do a Band-Aid. You try and just uh, video some of your classroom content and, and not try and invest and engage. And I think that this is the opportunity to say, we have a need, it cannot be fulfilled in our traditional way. And instead of going out with a, a quick solution that, that's temporary, looking at it as an opportunity to drive institutional change. Or trying to just make buy a technology and think that that does everything. It's the technology and the use of that technology that matters. That was to Steve's point earlier that you know the tool is part of it, but then it's also the onboarding and the change management of it and that way you execute with that technology. So, so guys, I think we've got a We've got to probably wrap up. We're a quarter past. We've still got 40 folks on. Steve, Cara, is there anything you want to add, uh, you know, as like in a closing point or a response to anything? Uh, no, I think just on my side, really quickly, I, I think great discussion. I think where GP is coming from, I think, I think you nailed it, right? I think you understand the challenge. Um, I, I'm excited, I think, about um, the questions that are coming through. And I think this is an amazing opportunity for our industry in general, right, as we're now starting to challenge you know, decades of thinking, and we've now got the technologies, we've got the behaviors that social media has created. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a really exciting time for all of us to be part of our industry. Thanks for joining, Steve. Cara, anything you want to add at the end? Yeah, it was funny. I was As I was listening, I was jotting down a couple of notes and kind of thinking through, like, what are the themes that I kept hearing and what would be, like, my takeaways? And I think the, the big one that jumps out, or a couple of things that jumped out to me is, this idea of thinking like a marketer, um, you know, to kind of think think outside of what a traditional learning professional might think of like, um, to think like a marketer, think outside of event-based learning, um, and think more about how do you develop learning closer to the flow of work that starts to create that culture and that habit of learning in a different way than what we've been able to do in the past. Um, so I think that kind of general theme is what I heard a lot of like both Ben and Steve say several times in different ways. And that was kind of what I had jotted down as like, yeah, that would be my takeaway um, after listening to this dialogue. Thanks, Cara. And look, if you guys come to the design webinar, we will really put that to the test, right? Like learn centricity, <laughs> right? Just like you do customer centricity, you know, learner centricity is paramount, right? You wouldn't release a product to market without knowing who those customers were and whether or not they were going to engage with that product. Why would you release learning? that didn't have the learner in the center, the person receiving that learning. And so really that mindset of thinking like a marketer is paramount. And we'll go into detail about at least the, our process that we get to what good looks like, which includes making decisions around the right technology at this moment in time for that business. But more than that, also the relevancy, uh, you know, those key takeaways that we gave. So, so thank you, Steve. Oliver, do you want to wrap us up and we'll. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, 
like 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 we said, we've uh, we kind of wrapped up 17 minutes ago, but uh, there are still some folks on the line. But uh, one of the things that I didn't mention is, um, of course, on top of this this ongoing series, we are still offering our complimentary 30-minute. Um, consulting call. So if any of these topics sparks an idea or you want to deep dive or you want to ask some questions, um, then I'd be happy to set that up with, with you. So that's for anybody who attended our webinar. That is an open invitation. I'll be emailing all of our attendees about that. So um, great. Um, you know, once again, I think an insightful session, loads of engagement, really grateful to our participants for jumping in and getting involved in the conversation. Um, and I'm really excited for our next one when we dive into design. So thank you once again, Steve, for the ridiculously early morning, but you really added so much value to this discussion. And thank you, Tara. Tara the ridiculously um, late at night. In the <laughs> ridiculously <laughs> late at night. And um, thank you for jumping in on some of those questions. I think when people watch back the recording, um, that, that summation of, of your key takeaway, um, I think, is one of the key um, elements for them to look for. So. And, uh, and of course, Ben, thank you for taking us uh, through this and to cool. the team behind the scenes who kept the technology working um, seamlessly. So thanks, everybody. See you awesome. later, everyone. Have a See wonderful you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. September. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resources hyphen library.